All right, I think we're ready to get started. So hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of McGill Executive Institute's Level Up webinar series. Uh, this session was developed in partnership with University Advancement and the Diz Hotel Faculty of Management. Uh, although, as you can tell, you'll be on mute, uh, we do want this session to be very interactive and we invite you to submit your questions and comments using the chat function at the bottom of your screen, which you're all getting used to. As I can see, we have tons of people from all over Canada, so many from Spain, that's amazing. So really looking forward to uh, learning with you all today. Uh, the webinar will last one hour and include time to answer your questions. Um, and it'll be recorded and shared with you afterwards. So uh, we can go to the next slide. Awesome. So we are very proud to welcome your webinar leader for today, Jean-Nicolas Raitt. He's a professor of organizational behavior at the faculty and an expert in remote work. My name is Pamela Sorrenti and I'm the director of public programs at McGill Executive Institute. And I'll be moderating the session today and ensuring all your questions get answered. Uh, so again, thank you for joining and let's get started. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, Pamela, for organizing this and thank you so much for the Executive Institute for organizing this series. Um, I'm really excited to, to exchange some information with you and get to know you a little bit better. Um, the goal is really to have, um, you know, an interactive session. So please, you know, ask questions in the chat. I have several opportunities for you guys to, to ask questions. Um, but so the first one that we have is about um, how you're feeling. Um, and so is it something, Pamela, do you do the, the poll or do I do it? Okay. No, perfect. I just launched the poll. <laughs> perfect. So please, yeah. um, you know, uh, answer how you're feeling. Yeah. It's a question I always like to ask when I'm doing a presentation so that, um, you know, I can kind of get a sense of how things are going. The mood seems to be pretty good. The yeah. mood seems to be pretty good. We have, you know, the majority of people are feeling good. Some people are feeling great. Um, and then we have some people who are feeling may or pretty bad and nobody's feeling bad. So if you're may or pretty bad, well, well I'm going to try to cheer you up a little bit for an hour and, and make sure you can have um, a better time. Okay. So um, I think, you know, I'm going to talk today about three different topics that are related to remote work. And you're going to see at the end how these three topics are related to one another. The first one, you know, which is uh, probably the biggest impact remote work and hybrid work and work from home have on organization is about cultural strength or the type of cultures that organizations are able to, to develop and to maintain. The second one I'm going to talk about is the, the boundaries between work and life, which is something that you know most of you probably have um, issues with. And then the last one, uh, which is one of my areas of expertise, but it's conflict resolution and negotiation. And I'm gonna give you some tips on how to negotiate um, you know, the terms of your hybrid work. So culture, what's culture? Uh, a lot of times, you know, I, in organizations, we talk about culture and the first thing that people talk about is, you know, the coffee machine or the water cooler and it's kind of like this informal thing. But culture, you know, is is just the DNA of the organization. It's uh, it means, you know, that it's it's what people do um, when people have a strong culture. They know they know what's expected of them. Um, they know what the organization is about um, and, and they know um, where to go from there. Um, it has a very strong impact on behavior. When the culture is weak, then you have, on the other hand, very, like a lot of confusion about what should be done, what the organization is about, um, and where to go from there. Um, so in what ways do, does remote work impact culture? Well, it does in, in a lot of different ways. The first one is isolation. So there is a lot of research on remote work. It's not, it's not a new topic. Um, it started really in the 90s uh, where, you know, the internet started to be to be a thing. Organizations have started to implement remote work. And one of the first things, you know, that was pretty salient in research is the fact that when people are working from home, they tend to feel isolated from the rest of the team. It's very, very true, especially when, you know, nobody is a remote worker except for you. Then because you're just not there, you're not part of the meetings, you're not part of the informal stuff. So you can feel pretty isolated. Um, that's one of the reasons why, you know, what we call today hybrid work, which is, you know, people working part of the week from home and part of the week from the office was already a thing, you know, 30 years ago. We just called it telework. 
uh, but it's it's this idea that if people spend too much time isolated from physically isolated from the rest of their team, they tend to perceive you know their, their role in themselves as freelancers or consultants and not so much as team members. So that's one thing. It's it's harder to maintain a culture when people have this feeling of isolation. The second one is not only do people feel isolated, but when you onboard new employees, they tend to be poorly socialized. The socially the, the socialization process is really how you transform an outsider into an insider and the socialization process typically is is um, managed by hr and hr has been very good you know you know at transforming you know giving the information and doing all of the formal socialization process but what we know is that socialization is not just the formal part it's not just knowing about the benefits and the terms of your contract and who you report to it's a lot about observing others it's a lot about asking informal questions to your peers and that kind of stuff is really difficult to do when people um, are socialized you know virtually so i know if you've started a new job, you know, during the pandemic, uh, or if you have colleagues who started a job during the pandemic, maybe you've never even met them in person. And so it's, it's a bit more difficult in terms of maintaining the culture. Another one um, that is really one of the main impacts of remote work on culture is through communication. Uh, what we know from very early research um, is that, you know, you have different types of communication, you have formal communication, uh, which people do through formal channels, you know, email, meetings, uh, phone calls, and then you have all the informal communication, like stopping by a colleague's office, um, observing somebody else. So when people work remotely and when they're separated from the rest of their peers, communication tends to be very, very task focused meaning people send emails about task related things. Um, so if you have you need a document for work, then you're going to send an email or you're going to give a phone call or organize a Zoom call. But what we know is um, employees tend to have more difficulties having informal communication through these channels uh, because there is just so many emails you're going to be sending to someone. So, for example, let's just say you're a new person uh, starting in a workplace. Well, you're not going to to send a lot of emails just to signal that you don't understand how things are going on. A lot of times, you know, people just send once or twice they do it, but then they just pretend that they understand and, and they stop sending emails because they don't want to look like uh, the person who doesn't get it. So that's really one of the things, you know, that's a bit difficult when you're trying to maintain a culture um, when people are working from home is that a lot of that communication that happens organically when people are together just doesn't happen. And as I was saying earlier, um, people really rarely bring issues forward. You don't want to look like, you know, the person who always has issues or the person who's always asking for stuff. And then finally, one of the last, you know, one of the main um, difficulties in maintaining a strong culture in an organization is about the assumptions. So. If you look, for example, at, you know, there is like the surface level of a culture, so you see how things are happening, right? I don't know, you, you look, you go to Google and then you see there is like, uh, like a tennis table, like, you know, they do, I don't know, like free, free food and all that kind of stuff. Well, it tells you uh, things about, you know, what they think about their employees, you know, they think, well, if we give if we give you know a good framework for employees to develop, then you know if we give them food, they're going to be more productive. Um, the issue is that sometimes the assumptions are a bit old-fashioned. So, for example, if you believe that um, employees are a bit sneaky and they tend to take advantage of situation when they can, or they don't, they're not really interested in working, then you end up with a culture that can be very, very dysfunctional. Um, I'm often asked, you know, questions about, um, you know, spying software, you know, which is something that, you know, has been developing and you have new companies doing this, but where like they take pictures of, you know, your screen or they take screenshots or they see how much you click and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes old management methods, right, can be a bit obsolete and, and don't really reflect, you know, the nature of work when people are from home. And so that's something we're going to talk, uh, we're going to talk about. So how do you deal with all of this? Um, one of the things, you know, that one of the topics that I study is, is how people think about the things they do. 
Um, and one of the main distinctions uh, when you do something is you can focus on how you do things and then you can focus on why you do things. Um, old management techniques tend to focus on telling people how to do things. And so you tell them, you know, you're, you're going to go to this meeting and then here are the documents you're going to fill out. And you really it's some sort of micromanagement where everything is coded and people people are told exactly what to do. It really usually is related to a weak culture and it makes people pretty uh, difficult to adapt because everything is coded and they always have to be told, you know, what to do. Um, I think, you know, uh, another way, a stronger way of managing people is by explaining them why they do something. And it's extremely important to understand that when, when employees are um, separated and they're at home, you know, and they're not really seeing, you know, their colleagues and they're not really seeing um, the work, the work that's being done, it can be very easy for them to just forget why the organization is doing it, what it does. And, and it's, it can be a bit depressing, it can lead to burnout when you're doing things and you just forget or you don't really realize why you're doing them. Um, so, so that's one of the main findings that there is in the telework literature, which is uh, to, to say, you know, don't tell employees how to do things, uh, because anyway, they're going to be working from home, you can't control if they're doing it the way you're saying, but tell them why they're doing things so that they can understand, you know, the overarching goal, and they can be more adaptable. So for example, if you have a situation where somebody has to find a new way of doing something, if they know why they're doing it, it's a lot easier for them to come up with a new method of doing it. Um, so if you if you're in the chat, I would love to hear, you know, what could be concrete ways, you know, that you can switch from how you know telling people how to do things telling them why to do things um i would love i would love for you to do that i think pamela is is the moderator for our chat today yes i am here it usually takes a couple of seconds for the the chat feed of to course start going so we'll give everyone uh, just a second so while while you're typing um one thing you know about the how that that typically um, is, is a bit difficult to manage, for example, is telling people when they should be working or at what time they should be working or in what location they should be working. Um, but but yeah, I see I see yeah, Pamela, you, do, you, do you want me to do it or do you want to do it? The, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So Karen just mentioned discussions of why at uh, the team meeting. Uh, to create this as a norm. We also have um, using your interactions to set expectations on end results um, and tell them. It's very good. How, Share mission and core values. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I love that too. Um, I work in cancer medication, so the why is all about the patient. Yeah, but it's, and it's always about the patient or the participant or the, you know, uh, the customer, right? Um, or it should be, I guess with that when we are talking about the why so yeah i mean you guys have great great examples uh that you can also follow in the chat uh but to spread the goals excellent uh involved in discussions so so it's something i i often talk with you know with managers and ceos and you know um a lot of the old management techniques that we have which is oh like you're five minutes late today you know or or you know that kind of stuff it's you know you have to really wonder if it's really useful and and so i think you know it's very very important uh to only keep you know uh to only keep measurement methods that are useful uh but but it's true focus on the why explain people why things are done and then it's going to help them uh be more adaptable um instead of you the know, why focus on the reason behind this here's the yeah. understanding heather uh heather mentions a very really good. good one um or sorry, it was KD, uh, and is to have the strategic discussion on how to change KPIs. Um, and I know yeah. that's something that we discussed uh, in planning this webinar was, you know, having to change key performance indicators and objectives while uh, remote working and how that ha needs to be a little bit different than the how you get something done, where you need to be while you're getting it done. What can you say on that, uh, Jean-Nicolas? Yeah, so so I completely agree. And and so when when you're going to be measuring performance, it's it's often a mistake to just try to translate it directly into the work environment, into the virtual work environment. Uh, but but it's true that you, you're always better off just looking at results and outcomes. And it's really something that has been discovered, you know, in the telework literature. 
um, that that is really efficient. I was seeing also somebody who was saying that this applies to knowledge workers. It's true. So it applies to knowledge workers and you have some jobs, right, where people need to be on the phone at a certain time or on location at a certain time. Uh, but but these people are rarely um, are rarely working from home or very flexible um, in work from home. Oh. Um, so right motivation should be maintained, mistakes should be allowed to learn, open flow of communication should be maintained to understand. That's, a, that's an interesting one uh, that Valerie's mentioning. And I'm wondering um, what your thoughts on is if an organization focuses on the how, do you think that they're less likely to accept mistakes? Do you think their culture is just one that's more unforgiving of mistakes than an organization that's focusing on the why? Um, I think, you know, there is definitely a period where organizations are going to have to switch between the how and the why, and this is definitely a period where, where you, you need to allow employees to make mistakes, uh, for sure. Um, and so I have a few, I have a few ideas that I wanted to share with you. So how do you do when you want to switch from a team, right? It doesn't have to be an organization overall, but it can be just a team. You want to switch from a team that's working mainly together or or entirely remotely to some hybrid work. Well, one of the things you know that I find the most important is to make culture intentional. And when I'm saying this, I don't really mean you know the corporate cringe uh, that sometimes you know we see on LinkedIn where where people are artificially creating uh, enthusiasm opportunities, but it's more about creating creating opportunities. For, for employees to socialize, creating opportunities for employees to understand the purpose, the overarching purpose around the organization. And that needs to be intentional. A lot of times culture just happens organically, but in telework or in remote work, it doesn't. And so that's why it needs to be more intentional. The second one is um, to, to have opportunities for employees to socialize informally. And so I think this is very important to understand that when employees are working a couple of days a week from home and a couple of days a week from the office, then it means that uh, we need to make sure that there are socialization opportunities, not that the offices are not a beehive where people just isolate themselves. The office needs to be a different type of office where people can where people can be working um, and socialize at the same time. It also means, you know, that uh, when people are in a central office, it's the it's the right time to have all the tasks that are collaborative. When they're at home, it's the time to have tasks that are more individually based. Um, Another one is the basic assumptions need to be re-examined. And so this is really something, you know, if you're in, in, in a team where a lot of the management focus is on, you know, are people arriving on time? Are people, you know, filling out the right documents? Um, then, then we need to look at the underlying assumptions because these things sometimes are very difficult to translate to a remote work environment. And I know this is one of the main difficulties sometimes that managers who tend to micromanage typically don't like uh, having remote employees because they can't really see them, uh, but but it's it's definitely something uh, to 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 question here as well. You know there was a question about performance indicators here as well. It's extremely important to look more at results and outcomes and a lot less at you know the process that people follow to to reach this outcome. And then finally, uh, another one that's uh, very important is onboarding. And so onboarding is to be rethought and and. One thing that organizations are doing um, when they're coming back to work, and I think it's an excellent idea, is to do a re-onboarding. Um, and I'm saying this because when people are poorly onboarded and they don't really understand what the organization does, um, a lot of times they've made it a habit not to ask about it. And just because they don't ask about it, and we're going to talk about conflict resolution later on, but just because they don't ask about it doesn't mean they're understanding it. And I think it's really important to, to do some sort of re-onboarding, not so much for um, the, the things you know that HR typically does, which is just a concrete aspect of the organization, because usually people have a, a, don't have a hard time understanding this, but it's more about understanding the spirit of the organization, uh, the spirit behind uh, what, what the organization does. And I think having a re-onboarding that can be pretty short, it could be one day, but really creates some opportunities for employees to ask questions, um, to, to, to be vulnerable and explain things that they understand and things they don't understand. Okay. So we're going to go into the second topic uh, that I wanted to discuss today, which is about role boundaries. And this is the topic that's extremely, um, extremely uh, key 
in the telework literature, if you look at most of the research on remote work is focused on the boundaries between work and life. And the reason for this is because, of course, when people work from home, um, there tends to be a blurring of these boundaries. So if you look at the traditional work week, right, which is temporal, so 9 to 5 p.m. from a central office, um, with a specific group of people, we've been going with this with this way of working for a hundred years, and this is what Ford, you know, came up with a hundred years ago, um, and and decided, you know, that this is how people would work, and this is something that made a lot of sense at the time because people were working in factories and people were working in production lines. If if you have somebody who's missing from the production line, then you can't you can't have a production line. It's stopped. So at the time, it made a lot of sense to do it this way. And even though the world has changed a lot, you know, we're still continuing on this way of working uh, with very strong, you know, temporal boundaries between work and life, very strong spatial boundaries. And we just have two different types of people. Uh, you have your peers and your colleagues and then you have your family. Uh, work from home, of course, blurs these boundaries. Um, and, you know, one concept that's really key in understanding those and understanding the blurring of boundaries is sometimes we can keep our roles really segmented, so we keep them separate and distinct, and then sometimes we can keep them more integrated and overlapping. I think, you know, if you've been working from home, you probably have seen, you know, how, how these can be happening. And so when people have segmented roles, then both, you know, are, are kept separate. And so that means a lot of times you're going to have to commute, you know, to go to work. Um, you're going to be working from specific times and you're going to be with specific people. And so you really keep those separate. If you are uh, keeping them more integrated, that means, right, that you can be working from home, you can be having your social life from home, um, you, can, you can be working and having social life at different types of times of the day. And so these are kept overlapping and integrated. One is not better than the other, and we know from research that people have um, people have um, uh, different advantages and issues. I see in the chat, Rupin is saying integrated roles equals uh, many working moms, and I completely agree. Uh, this is just a lot, you know, it's kind of like having two different hats that you keep switching between mom and worker or mom and employee. Uh, but that's that's very very true so there are still some advantages to keeping um the different roles integrated so one you know going to into working moms you know you have more flexibility dealing in competing demands right if you are if you are in a specific location for work it's going to be difficult to attend to personal responsibilities and same thing if you're at home taking care of your kids you can't really attend to different work responsibilities so one of the advantages is that when you keep them integrated, um, you can develop an overarching identity that kind of works for both. And that means, you know, if you have competing demands, you can attend to both. Uh, the second one about um, keeping them integrated is it's easier to transition. And just very, very specifically, right, if you have to go to a central office, it's harder to transition from one role to another because you have to commute. If you work from home, you can transition a lot easier. And so that really means you can organize a day that's a lot more flexible between the two. But it's not just positive things, right? And I think we all, you know, when we think about role integration and the overlap between work and home, um, so one thing you have more conflict between the roles. And so that means, you know, if you're working from home, you know, we, we've all seen the videos where you have like uh, a kid that's arriving in the background of a Zoom conversation or, or a Zoom or, or a TV or a TV interview. Um, so that's that's definitely something that can make a bit tricky, which is, you know, typically if you're at work, well, your kids don't really bother you. And if you're at home, your work doesn't really bother you. The second one that um, is definitely happening, and we we're talking earlier with Pamela, uh, which is the increased expectation of availability. And that's really something that's related to also like what I call the crackberries. Uh, what was called, you know, 20 years ago when we still had Blackberries, but now it's over. Um, it's really this idea that if you have a smartphone and if you're working from home, then maybe you're going to have colleagues who or, or superiors who are going to expect for you to um, to be always on and to be always available to work. Um, I, I often talk to to employees who tell me, well, I mean, sometimes I receive an email on Sunday night and and my boss tells me, hey, for tomorrow's meeting, here is what you have to do. And, you know, that's completely new, right? This is not something that happened before. There's really a lot of, you know, very, very increased expectations of availability. And we were talking with Pamela earlier, something that I noticed a lot in Zoom meetings 
But before, I used to be able to be late by five minutes, and then I would not receive an email right away. But now, if I'm late by thirty seconds, oh, I always, always receive an email where it's like, "Where are you? Are you available?" So a lot more um, expectations, a lot higher expectations in terms of availability. So the trick is to find you know ways to separate, to kind of have the best of both worlds, which is to separate both you know your work and your personal life so that you can enjoy both and so i would love for you guys to say in the chat what you do um so that you can you can really keep those a little bit separate so that you're not always having conflicts between your personal life and your work i know for me i've decided that i would not work on sundays that's been my thing even if people tell me sometimes i have meetings on saturdays uh, because something is useful for students, but I've just decided that this I, I will not do that on Sundays because I need to have some time just to to decompress and and not have anything. So I'd love to hear uh, so we can share with everybody what tricks you have found to create a greater separation between your work and your personal life. I really like the no work on Sundays, on Nicola. I, I take a similar stance and I uh, I try and book myself, you know, at times like no work, well, not no work, but focus times essentially. Yeah. Um, so let's see what everybody else has to say. I don't answer emails on weekends unless it's an emergency. So no weekends, no nights. Uh, I have a separate workspace in my home. That, that's super important. Um, isolated office in the home. I won't check my emails on weekends. Meditation, take weekends, uh, keep a fitness routine. A lot of people are saying evenings and weekends are off, off limits for work, which is really great. Um, going to the gym. So I guess, you know, some self-care uh, is coming up as well. Um, let's see, separate, separate cell phone for work and I turn it off. Excellent. Um, from five to nine, um, my time is with my kids. Hard stop. I like that being being focused. Uh, your yeah. energy is focused at certain times of the day, right? So you know that's it. Your family time is your family time. It's interesting because in in the whole BlackBerry literature that was done in the early two thousands, you know, they were identifying how you know on the one hand, so you were available all the time, and you had parents, you know, who would go to like an event for the kids, but would always be on the BlackBerry. So they're not they're you know they're in neither role, right? They're ne doing a good job at, at either they're on the one hand they're not really paying attention to the kid and on the other hand they're still like kind of you know not really productive because they're on the blackberry i really also like uh to have you know the commute time is spent taking a, a walk that's really interesting so i something to say um the, so telework programs um we're not that widespread and we're going to talk maybe later about why that was you know before the pandemic but telework programs were done a lot more seriously in air quotes than what we've been doing with the pandemic. Uh, the way we've been doing telework has been pretty wild uh, because, you know, we just send people home and then, you know, you work, you do whatever, like, you know, you work and, and that's it. But in most telework programs before the pandemic, it's done very, very carefully where, um, you know, companies will not allow you to telework if you don't have a separate office. They're not going to allow you to telework if during your work time you have um, care, you have to care for a child. And so it's and, and they have also like training for managers on how to how to manage remote workers. And so really, I think, you know, a lot of the time, you know, organizations have identified that it's important to let people have some sort of a boundary between the two. Um, sometimes it's also a behavioral boundary, meaning you just don't don't behave the same depending on on where you are. I remember reading this paper about um, maids, you know, that was a long time ago, but maids who were uh, living on premises and during the weekends, they were not even cooking for themselves because they didn't want to do what they were doing for work. And so they were just doing something else. Um, OK, very good. Uh, so so let's let's move forward. Thank you so much, uh, Pamela. So how do you how do you reduce role conflict kind of to summarize a little bit uh, what you guys have been saying. Um, so two things, you know, there is boundary work, uh, which is you, you So that's what we call boundary work in research, which is you, you reestablish new boundaries between the different responsibilities that you have. Uh, so temporal boundaries, right, we talked about it, which is, you know, some of you were saying, well, I take a walk and that's my commute. I know sometimes I talk to remote workers who say, well, you know, I bring the kids, you know, on foot to school and that's my commute. Then I come home and I'm in worker mode and then, you know, I work for the whole day. And then when I go pick them up, I'm switching to being parent mode. Another one can be spatial boundary, 
which is, you know, you have a separate place that you can close where you're working. I know, like, I have, like, a really big living room. Um, and by the way, I always say I have a lot of fish tanks. My whole place doesn't look like this. It's just, you know, just a corner. Um, so it's not that crazy. Um, but, but, you know, I know like this location here for me is for work. This is not where I relax because I can't really relax, you know, on the weekend here. So I just have a separate computer. Um, and then you have social boundaries, you know, which is, um, you know, the people you hang out with, you know, do you hang out with your colleagues or do you call them? Thank you so much, Isabel, for the fish tanks. Thank you. Um, um, and so it's all about, you know, keeping keeping both separate and so not answering professional emails, you know, on the weekends or when you have child responsibilities uh, to really keep uh, both social circles separate. Another one which is extremely important, and so that's related to research that I was running with an executive MBA from McGill. We have an executive MBA with uh, McGill and I should say, and very, very bright woman who was extremely interested in the expectations we have in terms of um, boundary management when we see people. And so one of the things we looked at, we ran an experiment to see, you know, how do you perceive when you see on Zoom somebody and there is a kid in the background or you have personal items in the background or what you see when the person is very keen on saying that they just keep all of it very separate. Um, and so what we've noticed is that th there are very strong stereotypes that we relate uh, to the types of the types of ways people manage the boundaries, and we've seen that when people have uh, look like they have overlapping work and personal lives, then they're seen as you know better parent, but they've see, they're seen as um, disorganized employees. And when they have um, you know when they keep it very separate, they're seen as more organized you know employees and not as good parents, or maybe not as warm and nurturing. I think it's just important to understand that there is no right or wrong way of doing it and we do associate stereotypes with how people manage these boundaries but a lot of times it's based on personal preference some people prefer to keep their their roles separate and distinct some people prefer to keep them overlapping and combined it really depends on how on, on how they prefer to do it and what's most efficient for them i think it's just important to understand that we're all very very different and and you know if something is working for one person it doesn't mean that it's good or bad it just means that it's different Okay, um, so now we're going into um, the third topic that I wanted to discuss, which is, um, you know, kind of the, the interplay of cultural strength and role integration um, creates, it creates a lot of conflicts. And so most of the classes that I teach in at McGill and our MBA, but also in our BCom is, is our negotiation classes. And so negotiation is, is a conflict resolution method where you try to get a win-win and you try to get, you try to find a way to align incompatible goals. So incompatible goals can be something very, very simple, such as, you know, where is work done? You know, I, am I allowed to work from home or am I not allowed to work from home? I know, you know, we've had, for, for decades, we've had remote work, but organizations have not been very keen on letting people work from home. And, you know, a lot of times what, what I heard, what I used to hear at the time from, from managers about, you know, why can't people work from home a couple of days a week? Um, a lot of times managers would say, oh, that's not how we do things. You know, that's just not how we do things. And it was fine as an answer for a while, but I think, you know, with the pandemic, a lot of employees have realized, well, actually we can do it this way. We don't have to always do things the same. And so sometimes, you know, it can be a conflict. I've heard, you know, I see organizations are saying, oh, we're bringing back everybody in person. And, and I know that there is a widespread um, uh, tendency for people to really want to, to work from home part of the week because it's, it solves a lot of problem. So when should, when should work be done? Am I flexible with my schedule? What work should be done? How is performance assessed? How are promotions uh, decided? And, and something to know is, you know, when you're a manager or an employee, I was saying most people uh, deal with, uh, with conflict resolution a little bit differently. And so we're gonna see that in the next slide, but I would love for you guys, if you can type in the chat, what are the conflicts if you know that you've seen maybe it's it's you you are having a conflict you know with your management or maybe it's other people but what have you heard in terms of conflict uh, for the future of work uh, for the way should be done the way work should be done is it about you know can i work from home is it about how am i uh, managed so please type it in the chat I, I would find it very interesting if you can tell me what are the tensions that you're experiment you're experiencing in relation to this
while we're waiting, one thing I've noticed a lot on on uh, on LinkedIn is the idea that you know organizations survive because uh, yeah. we're willing to work from home, and now organizations are kind of going back and saying, "No, we want you back full time in person," um, which is interesting. Um, I think yeah, this is why. Like I think a lot of times. Um, this is why, uh, you know, there is like this phenomenon that we're seeing in Canada and we're seeing in the US where employees, even though we're not in a good economic situation, we still have a lot of employees who quit and they quit because they can't get, you know, the work arrangement they want to get. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's adding to the, the employee or the, the talent crisis we're in. Right. Uh, so yeah. to go back to the question, uh, some of the answers here are productivity versus mental health and burnout performance reviews. Um, lots of discussions on uh, need to be in office when all colleagues, clients, meetings are not co-located. Um, yeah. Micromanagers cannot handle employees working from home. Yeah. <laughs> um, the perception that remote work is not as productive as being in the office. Yeah. Uh, disparity on holding meetings where some are in the office and some are not, if not supported by a good tech and behaviors. Uh, let's see. Anything else you're noticing yeah. in here? seeing more coaching clients, especially women who are expected to over deliver on time and projects. Well, we spoke okay. about that too, right? That we're actually more productive at home. And now the difficulty is trying to scale back and just, you know, um, yeah. And One of the things that, that was identified very early on in the remote work literature is that we actually, re people who work from home tend to work longer hours. Um, Winter is back, but not commuting. Yeah, it's a huge contribution to the work-life balance. I agree. You know, not having to commute is very helpful. This is also something I'm often asked questions about. Uh, you know, what about city centers, right? Because remote work, of course, has very detrimental impacts on city centers. But it was not a utopia either. You know, like we we look at what was you know difficult, what was good about having a lot of people come into into beehives, right, and and stack themselves into subways and and arrive and have two hours of commuting a day. You know, 50 years ago, when we were doing a lot more physical jobs, the, the main thing people were struggling with was like back problems. But today it's stress and anxiety. It's a huge problem. Most people, you know, experience some stress and some anxiety and, and having to commute and being stacked into huge office towers doesn't really help with that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially not in the wake of COVID when, you know, you're yeah. uncomfortable, you know, potentially uncomfortable with, you know, just being. And it's people. true, like Camilla was saying, working at home impacts mental health on many people living alone. I, I really agree with this. Um, and we see this in my faculty. We have some older professors, you know, who are single and, and, you know, a lot of the motivation they got was from seeing people in person. I mean, I know for me, I'm, I'm really excited. We get to be teaching in person again, and it really gives you some energy to do it. It was really good. We did the right thing, um, you know, by, by, you know, having everything virtual for a year and a half, but I'm happy we can be back in person and I hope we can, uh, we can continue to do so. I also see availability expectations on single people versus family people. So all of this definitely creates issues, which is, you know, if you're single, maybe people expect that you're going to be available to work, you know, on evenings because you're not taking care of kids. And so it can create some unfairness uh, or feelings on unfairness. Um, I totally agree. So, um, so so now we're just going to talk really quickly about um, kind of like how do you deal with these with these things so in negotiation one of the main biases that we suffer from naturally um, is the fixed pipe perception and so the fixed pipe perception is this idea that if if i'm going to to get something from you um, then it's going to be at your cost and there is a fixed pie and we're here to just slice it and somebody will win and somebody else uh, will lose um, this is um, this usually results in three different types of mindsets, and we're going to go in the next slide after, and I'll, I'll get more in details with it. But either you resign yourself to capitulating to the counterparty um, because you just don't want to have this conflict. The second one is you you prepare for hard bargaining with the counterparties so you can become a bit more aggressive. And the third one is you compromise to reach a midpoint between opposing demands. So the compromise typically is seen as, you know, kind of the best outcome, but it's really not. And so let's just imagine, right, that you have a conflict with management about something such as, you know, work like 
work location or how many days a week can you work from home or work availability. Um, you, you basically your response to that conflict will be across you know two different dimensions, which is how cooperative you are and how assertive you are. Um, most people, and I'm saying if you look at the studies that have been conducted, and I've, I've run a bunch of those as well, most people um, are very uncomfortable being assertive about their wants and needs, and to such an extent, you know, that they don't negotiate anything, and I'm talking 70 to 80% of the general population refuses to negotiate anything, and that includes, you know, the term of their employment. So this is why 70 to 80% of the population accept the first offer they receive from their employer and just don't negotiate the terms. Um, this is this is uh, not efficient because most companies, when they make you an offer, they have you know some some buffer and some margin for negotiation. But that's also true for things like how many days a week are we going to to be working? Um, it's important to know this because a lot of times, you know, if you're a manager and you're making a decision, you have to know that people will naturally not be very assertive about their wants and needs. But it doesn't mean they agree with it. Just because they're, they're not saying anything doesn't mean they agree. And so typically people are, would naturally go into um, the accommodating or the avoiding uh, type of conflict resolution. And so, you know, the accommodating means you're going to do what you're told, but it doesn't mean you agree with it. And so a lot of times maybe you're going to feel frustrated or resentful. Avoiding means you're going to quit. And that is something that I've seen a lot during the pandemic and the return, return to work, which is a lot of people are quitting, even though, um, you know, we're not in a great, you know, economic condition. But they're quitting and they don't even tell you why they quit. And so you don't really know, you know, what, what the reason is or how you can change the system, uh, which is an issue. Another one that is also dysfunctional is the competing. And so competing means, you know, you become very aggressive, you're uncooperative, meaning you really look about, you look at your own thing and you don't really look at your the, the other party's needs. And typically the compromising means we neither get, neither of us get what we want, we just get half of what we want. So what you really want to be doing when you're trying to resolve a conflict is you want to be assertive, meaning you want to be defending your wants and needs, but you also want to be cooperative. And so the goal is really to try to understand if you can negotiate on different things so that you can both get what you want. Um, I remember I was advising one of our students who was on the job market and he um, he was telling me, you know, that he wanted to get like he was negotiating with a startup in Toronto and he was telling me about the salary he wanted to get. And I was telling him, you know, you need to look at, you know, different things besides salary. It cannot be just one thing, because if it's one thing, then the only thing you can do is like slice the pie. You can't really expand the pie, but you can expand the pie if you're negotiating on different things because that means that you have different dimensions. And if people have different relative preferences, then, then you can expand the pie and create value at the cost of no one. So um, in that situation, for example, the startup was pre-seed, so they couldn't give him um, <clears throat> the highest salary in his promotion, but it's not something that was his highest priority. For him, one priority was also to have time to work on personal projects and personal development projects. And so they agreed that he would have a salary, he would make a compromise on salary, but in exchange, he would get 20% of his work time dedicated to personal learning projects, so coding in that situation. Um, both of them are excited about it and happy about it, and both, you know, they end up with a better and stronger relationship out of it. It's because they have different relative preferences. They didn't care equally about the same things. So that means, you know, you can at the cost of no one, you can you can create um, win win agreements. So as as Rupin is saying, collaborating equals problem solving together, you can you can picture yourself doing, you know, collaborating in in different ways. But a lot of times it could be you're sitting one next to another and you're solving a problem together as opposed to, you know, arm wrestling or that kind of stuff. Um, so how do you approach a negotiation? Um, I think, you know, when, when, so most people worry about negotiation, and especially, uh, you know, when it's a negotiation about things you care about. Um, I know I have colleagues, you know, in the admin staff, you know, 
with, for example, who, who want to be working from home several days a week, some who don't want to do this. And so it's really, you know, it could be a bit scary to just go to your boss because you worry that you're not going to get what you want. Um, something to really that's really, really important is that the verbal part of the exchange, which is the meeting, is really usually just 10 minutes. You know, it's not really the long part, but it's the part that's very scary for us. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I think there's a very negative stereotype with that part. We think about, you know, playing 3D chess or, or you know, like the arm wrestling or that kind of stuff. And none of these images really fit, in my opinion, with what negotiation is. This is why when people tell me they're good negotiators, I'm always a bit skeptical because it really depends on what they think, you know, negotiation is. To me, anybody can be a good negotiator and it's really not hard to be a good negotiator. You just need to have a method. And so, so what's the method? Well, the first thing is that 80% of negotiation success is preparation. A lot of times people are worried about negotiation because they just don't know what they're going to be asking for, or they don't know how to be asking for. This is something, by the way, one of the biggest uh, misconceptions about job offer negotiation is that you need to let the employer make the first offer. And a lot of times my students tell me that, and it's because they don't know how much they want to ask for. Well, don't let the other party um, don't let the other party determine, you know, the, the anchor they're going to use and, and you need to know what you want. So the first thing is to determine what you want very concretely. You know, do you want to be, if you want to be working from home, what are the days you want to be working from home and, you know, uh, how, you know, what, what are the times and all that kind of stuff. The second thing is what can you compromise on? You know, there are things, for example, you have priorities, for example, it could be working from home three days a week. Well, what are things that you can compromise on? Could it be helpful to your company if you were more flexible in terms of work time? Uh, sometimes, you know, you have people who work in different time zones, and that could be something that um, that could be useful. Um, the second thing, the third thing, sorry, that you need to figure out is why you should get what you want. And so this is something that's extremely important, which is the reasons why you should get what you want have to be appealing to the other party as well. Of course, you have personal reasons to get to get what you want and you know why you want to be working from home three days a week, but you know you need to find overarching reasons that also appeal to both. Um, the fourth one is decide how you want to ask for it, and so this one is extremely important, which is uh, what words are you going to be using. You know, it's it's sometimes, you know, people wait too long before they decide, you know, so they have to figure it out, you know, on the go when they're in front of the person. This is really um, kind of a recipe for disaster because maybe you're going to say something that's not going to be very smart. Maybe you're not going to be very clear. Uh, maybe you're going to say something a bit offensive or you're just going to convey an idea you don't want to convey. I think it's always good whenever I advise a student, for example, to negotiate a job offer, I always tell them, you know, determine what you want, what you can compromise on, why you should get it, but also have a paragraph ready, you know, that kind of summarizes all of this. And then, you know, because then you can really see the problems and you can find the words that really work for you. And then, you know, the meeting in person or on the phone or over Zoom, the only thing you have left to do is to just say what you've prepared so that, you know, you, you've already made your case, you say what you've prepared, you listen to what they have to say, and then you find an arrangement with the other party. Okay, so we have around 10 minutes. Um, I see I see we've had um, a, a few a few questions. Um, Pamela, I don't know, how do you want to do this? Yeah, so I definitely already have quite a few questions that I said I would bring to the Q&A. So we'll okay. start with those and then hopefully have time for some more as I'm sure they'll come through the chat. Sure. sure. Um, okay, so this is on the, you know, uh, the role of more on the role of negotiations. So I'll bring this one yeah. first. I started working from home more often after COVID. I really enjoyed it. My manager says we want to see you more at the office. I asked no. why, and he replied, we just want to see you at the office. So how do I deal with this kind of managerial mentality? And what should an employee do in this circumstance? Okay. Um, so, so I think definitely it's good to have a discussion with the manager and ask again, you know, for a reason, for a reason as to why that is so that you can find a compromise between the two. Um, I think, you know, if I were you, I would, I would determine how many days, you know, I want to work from home. And then I would ask specifically, you know, to work from home these days and say that the other days you'll be working from the office. I think, you know, unfortunately, um, the, the, the reasoning of, you know, we just want to see you more at the office, 
typically it's a bit frustrating for employees because you know it's it's not a valid reason right it's, it's, so it's something you know that usually people quit about uh, so to me you know it's about asking them about what is the overarching reason as to why why you want to see this and then try to look more than into the specifics and and offer offer something offer i'm going to work on mondays and tuesday from from home and then i'm going to work the rest of the week from the office and then see what they have to say about it excellent and i guess that goes back to the beginning where we were talking about the roles right and yeah. the how versus the why which yeah. leads to a question um which is that uh, after explaining the why uh, yeah. is it a good idea to ask you know your your employee how they would want to proceed yeah i mean it's definitely so so it's extremely important uh to be there also to let employees test ideas and see how things are working i think you know it's always great to tell them the why and then you explore with them how they want to do it and then you can give them you know your advice i think you know it's important to understand that most likely people are better at determining the how than you because you know they're the ones doing it uh, but but definitely there, you just don't want to be prescriptive in, in the how, you want to give them some freedom, uh, but you also want to be there as a resource. Ideally, you know, you have a good relationship with people and they understand, you know, you're on the same team and so they can just ask you questions. It's not like this arm wrestling thing. It's more about thinking together and solving a problem together. I love that. Okay, so next um, is that, you know, the word outcome has, you know, morphed into some trendy buzzword. Um, yeah. It's very, an outcome is very contextual. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, it is directly tied to vision and goals, but it often gets mixed up with results. And then there was, you know, I'm kind of morphing a few questions here. Um, yeah. You know, people are saying that being remote is more productive but yeah. in, is it perceived and measured as more productive by management? So what are your thoughts on, you know, outcome versus results, productivity and measurement? How can this all be, you know, done? Yeah, there is, there is um, an HBR article, Harvard Business Review article that is extremely interesting. Um, that's called uh, On the Folly of um, Asking for A while, while Rewarding B. And so it's about, you know, and I think, you know, this idea of outcome and results really is tied up to this, um, because one of the main difficulties, for example, is you're going to have situations where um, team teamwork is desired. And so where you really are going to be expecting people to work in teams, but then you're going to be rewarding individual performance. And so if you do that, you know, then you're undermining teamwork. I think here as well, you know, the, the goal the goal is uh, to have indicators that reflect actual performance. A lot of times you can't do that on a daily basis for knowledge workers, but you can do that every few months. Um, HR typically has, you know, 360 reviews where you can have, you know, you can review people in more of a qualitative banner. Um, and so I think here, the same thing, I've been working with a couple of companies in Montreal uh, who, who are setting this up. And I think what's important here is to have an observation phase where you're trying with different, you know, trying with different indicators and you're trying to see the ones that are the best reflecting um, of actual performance. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, one of the things is, would it be useful to have, you know, a lot of times group performance is easy, is easier to, to, to assess. So maybe you could move on to something that's a little bit more group based. And I know, I know that sometimes managers are worried about this because they worry about people who are free riders, but you know, you have to realize free riders are going to happen anyway, but you can still identify them in group performance and then you can still, you know, get rid of them or, 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 you know, put more pressure on them. A, a system shouldn't be, shouldn't be designed just to deal with free riders because free riders only represent a very tiny proportion of most people. So I think, you know, if you're doing something that's a lot based on teamwork, well then focus on teams and then focus on team, you know, team-based criteria. And then you can add on top of this, you know, a layer to identify free riders. But, but I think it's fine to accept, you know, that people are team workers and people want to be successful in their work and people want to be doing the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, a different question. Can you comment on your thoughts about France's legisl legislation on non-work hour emails? Do you 
So if you're a company of 50 employees or more, you cannot email an employee after typical work hours. The labor law amendment has come about because studies show that in the digital age, it's increasingly difficult for people to distance themselves from the workplace during their off hours. Yeah, and, and also you worry about, you know, retaliation if you don't, you know, if you don't respond, if you're trying to set a boundary. Personally, you know, I'm French, and so personally, you know, I'm in favor, I'm in favor of that law. I think it's important to give people the right to, to have, you know, some time without work. Um, I've seen, you know, we have, you know, even even people that I know, right, who are working nonstop, like it's a nonstop stream of email, of emails that they just constantly have, and they feel guilty if they don't answer them, and they really want to do the right thing, and they don't bring it up to their boss. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to do. It's a little bit counterintuitive sometimes for managers. It's a little bit, I've been talking a lot about the four day work week, for example, you know, after like all of these, um, these things that have been done in, I in Iceland where they've been showing that the four day work week could be beneficial. There's been a lot of research on the four day work week for a while. Um, and so these things, right, can, can look a little bit counterintuitive in the sense of, you know, it looks like people are going to work less. But in reality, they're actually working better because, you know, they're not as, as tired, uh, they're not as drained or as burnt out. So it's definitely something, you know, that that could be implemented. In my opinion, I think it's a good thing. But here, here again, right, it's it should be a collaborative thing. So it's something that you try and it's something you see if it works out. And if it doesn't, then you change to something else. Mm -hmm. It's all about trying it, right? <laughs> OK, yeah. so last well, not maybe we have time for two more depending on the question sure. so can you comment on the thought that if you're no longer living in a large city so Toronto Vancouver because you can telecommute why there would be a decrease in compensation this is something I have heard about that employees are decreasing compensation um, thoughts so it's it's all about you know, so if you look at leverage that you have in a negotiation, then typically, you know, one of the things that I advise my students to do is to say is, you know, if they're going to go in Vancouver or Toronto, you know, is you use the fact that, you know, the cost of living is high. Um, so that's one thing. Well, I mean, the cost and compensation could be changed by, you know, the fact that now you need a car. And so, you know, maybe you maybe you're not going to be paid as much. Um, because maybe uh, you're not going to pay as much for your rent or for, you know, buying your house, but maybe you're, that's going to be compensated with the fact that now you need to have a car. And so that's expensive as well. Um, here as well, you know, I think it's a case by case uh, basis. And I think, you know, definitely I've seen Google, for example, is trying to do this, saying that if people don't live in San Francisco, then you can pay them less. Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, it's all about, it's all about, you know, the alternatives that you have. If you have an alternative that is uh, better, then you have more power in the negotiation. Um, if you don't have an alternative, it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder. So I'm not, I'm not really quite sure what to, what to give in terms of advice. Um, my, my advice would be to make a case that sure, like some things have gone down, like the cost of rent, but some other things now you have to do them, like, which is now you need a car now and that's more expensive. Mm -hmm. And the call, I mean, are we being remunerated for the, for where we live or the quality and value of our output? Yeah. As well, I would imagine. Okay, Definitely. so very, very quickly, maybe in like a 20 seconds, sure. <laughs> Simon is asking, uh, curious how you create personal connections with a team that can no longer meet in person. Yeah, so so I think what's important, you probably have all seen this where, you know, people do like the Zoom coffees and, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it started in the beginning and then it kind of stopped. Uh, where people stop doing it. I think, you know, when the team is not meeting in person, a lot of times it's easier to have smaller group meetings um, so that people don't feel like they have to do it. What you want to do is create opportunities for uh, for people to want to want to attend these meetings. If you make them mandatory and if you make it like they're forced to do it, it's not really interesting. But if you create an opportunity where people really have an opportunity to, to talk and, and to have a good time together, then, then it's more interesting. And I think if you're a manager of a team, for example, well, during these meetings, you could behave differently, more personally, um, be more personable, um, maybe more chill, and you can share more and more uh, personal information. Um, I know, for example, you know, one thing that people struggle a lot with is to get people to be involved 
um, in meetings, right? A lot of people keep their camera off and that kind of stuff. Well, if you force people to keep the camera on, like they're not, it's not very motivating. What I do is I, I whenever, you know, I tell them it would be cool if some turn their camera on. And when they do, I just greet them, you know, friend, like friend, like we're friends. And I think, you know, it's just nicer and we have a better relationship. And I think, you know, people are more excited to do it this way uh, than when, when they're forced. Love it. Okay, so that is all the time we have for questions today. I just want to thank everyone who joined in to make this uh, session a success. And thank you, Jean Nicolas, for this very uh, interactive session. Um, thank you so with, much. Within the next 24 hours, you'll all be receiving an email from us with a recording of the session, some of the helpful resources also that Jean Nicolas have, have uh, mentioned. And uh, so thank you again. We'd love to stay in contact. If you have any questions at all, feel free to send us an email add us uh, to your LinkedIn network. And our next session will be on strategy with JP Ferguson on September 22nd. So we hope to see you there. All right, thank well, you. on that note, thank you, thank Pamela. you everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good one, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.